Welcome everybody to the third installation of our R3 parent webinar series. Um, this month we have again, Dr. Thomas DeMaria. Um, Dr. Maria is both a clinical and a school psychologist uh, with over 20 years experience. Uh, so we are really, it's an honor to have him again, sharing his expertise with us. This month, he's going to be talking about uh, how to help your child manage their anxiety and fears. And so without further ado, I will hand it off to Dr. DeMaria. Thank you so much, Eric. And it's an honor to be able to present to uh, you guys again. Um, the topic tonight is one that all parents have to encounter. It's those moments when your children come to you with these fears and you don't know what to handle them. So what we're going to talk about today is what you can do uh, as a parent uh, to help your ch children with their anxiety. So kind of the, the outline of the whole presentation today is I'm going to talk about stress, emotions, and anxiety. Uh, relaxation as a family activity. That's going to be fun uh, for you guys to do. And I'll, I'll go over some fun ways that families incorporate relaxation uh, activities. And I'm going to sort out the identification and changing of anxious self-talk uh, thoughts uh, that children have who get anxious. Uh, and children, I'm referring to both uh, children in younger grades and high school students too. Uh, so I'll use children rather than saying children and adolescents. And we're going to work to make you guys uh, be uh, talented as both coaches and cheerleaders, and uh, we're going to be, help you guys learn how to model coping, because kids pick up a lot from us. Our children see us and watch us all the time, so uh, we're going to help you guys bring those skills together. So I want to start first off with stress, because a lot of children sometimes don't understand that they're feeling stress, and they call it anxiety, but a lot of times it's the stress that they're feeling. And oftentimes understanding what stress is, and which is their response, and stressors, what caused the stress, can really help them kind of understand the first level in terms of dealing with fears and anxiety is managing the stressors in their life and the stress that they feel. So what is a stressor? Stressors uh, are come from two places. There's ones we cause ourselves, and there's ones that are caused by the outside. The ones we cause by ourselves are those uh, demands we make of ourselves and those things we ask ourselves to do that really seem overwhelming. Those are stressors we put on ourselves. What's outside of us is sometimes hard to manage. You know, uh, if you have a paper to do or if you have something that you gotta you gotta kind of work on, it's kind of hard to uh, uh, you know take get rid of that stressor. That's gonna happen. Um, some children wish there were never tests and exams and as parents and as a parent myself, I wish there weren't tests and exams too, but you gotta learn how to deal with that stressor. Stress is how you respond to those stressors. What happens when the stressor hits us? It's how our body responds. And for everybody, it's the same type of response. And really it's based on the children's perception and their appraisal of the threat or change that the stressor requires. So to kind of think about it in a way, oops, uh, when wind hits your house and you hear that wind howling, uh, the wind is the stressor and the house is the person or, or the child who handles all that stress and it stands still a little bit. Uh, the trees are handling the stressor of the wind and the trees are bending. The house doesn't need to bend because the house has all those uh, defenses, if you want to call it coping skills. It's got a lot of thick walls. But the trees learned that to cope with the stress or of the wind, they got to bend a little bit. So you can see that sometimes stressors cause us to be firm and we can handle them easily, like this house with the wind. But certain times stressors cause us to bend a little bit. And in order to handle the stressor, we got to bend a little bit. So remember, stressors are what happened to children and stress is what the child feels. And sometimes stressors become overwhelming, uh, as you can see. What starts off at a little bit of rain at the bottom of the screen, you can see there be floods and, and things that can overwhelm us. And so the stressor can overtax our capacity to manage that stress. And that's why building better coping skills and teaching child to face things can help them be more resilient. And that's what this really is all about, how to help your kids be stronger uh, dealing with their anxieties that they have. Now, research has found that children kind of have the same type of thing that stresses them out, the same sorts of stressors. Number one is negative evaluations by peers, their friends, and adults. They don't like to be criticized, as, as you probably know. Mom and dad, don't tell me what I should do. You're making fun of me. You're picking on me. 
again, they're really sensitive to criticism. And it gets worse as they get older. Feeling uh, or being excluded socially, being left out, uh, fear of missing out, I think is what the kids usually put in their, their apps and everything, but it's not being part of the social group. Fear, fear of failure and fear of violence and or bullying. Um, and a lot of children report that fear. They don't know how to deal with that aggressive peer or that situation where somebody is, is giving them a hard time. Uncertainty about the future and you know, worrying about what they'll be, especially among teenagers, you know, what will happen after they graduate, what job they'll do, if they're going to go to college, where it kind of can cause them a lot of stress. Parental conflict and abandonment, uh, you guys fighting or fighting in the home or parent have to go away to work or maybe they're being deployed or they, there's, there's something cause them not to be in the house can cause the child stress. And anytime a child has a conflict with an adult, why? Because adults have more power, more knowledge, and we hope more wisdom. And that's tough for children. That causes them a lot of stress. So these are the stressors that kids face almost every day to some degree. And how the child can handle those stressors can help them reduce the amount of stress that they feel. Now, this is kind of a simplified version of what happens. But when stress hits us, we all, we all have reactions. Uh, we all have the same basic autonomic nervous system is the fancy word for it, but we all have the same way that adrenaline or the stress hormones hit our body. Uh, if you wanna start from the, the, the head to the toe, the first response is the uh, response that says, oh my goodness, let's prepare for battle, so to speak. Let's prepare for whatever this challenge is gonna give us. And that, that stress response causes our body to get ready. And so what happens is, um, the flow of saliva decreases. We get really dry because all that fluid is being pulled back into our body. Our skin, our blood vessels constrict, so we start to get that cold chills, the sweating is when we're really stressed out. And your hair, believe it or not, will start to stand up if you're under a lot of stress. The heart beats faster because all those fluids are moving back into the torso. We're trying to take them and, and conserve them in the torso. And the stomach, all that digestion stops because if you're getting ready to fight a battle, if you're getting ready to fight a challenge, all that stuff sits in your stomach. So what happens is if you had a big lunch and you get stressed in the afternoon, that that stuff ain't going anywhere. And it could cause like a crampy feeling for people under a lot of stress. Our muscles become more tense. And because our muscles are so tense, because all that stress hormones are flowing in our body, remember getting us ready, our muscles become stressed. So you got tense muscles, which are also cold <laughs> and they're sweating. That cold, clammy hand you kind of feel sometimes. For our eyes, our pupils dilate. So what happens is we lose peripheral vision. We only see in front of us. You know, that's, that's what happens because we want our visual acuity to be straight ahead of us. And our eyes become kind of fixed. It's what's called focal lock. We can't see out of the periphery of our eyes. Our lungs take quick, deep breathing. And that causes us to get a little lightheaded. Our bowel movements we talked about slowing down. And our blood vessel blood pressure increases because all of our major vessels that dilate, we're pumping all this blood. So that's all what happens. You know, it stresses the body to keep that up for a little while. But after a little while, the other process happens. So the reverse of all this happens. The stomach starts to want to go to the bathroom because it's been sitting with all that food. Our hands start to feel warm, but all those areas where the blood wasn't flowing maybe feel a little tingly. We start to salivate more. Our bowel movements, especially our bladder, because we were so dry when we were under stress, drinking a lot of fluid. So we're drinking a lot of fluid. We take those deep sigh breaths because we've been hyperventilating a lot. And for kids, that's scary. They don't have a, a textbook on what it means to feel stress. And for a lot of children, that causes them to start to be frightened by the stress response. And sometimes they'll label that as anxiety. So understanding how the body, everybody goes through the stress response together can help children kind of understand that it's normal and it's what we go through, but how big it is or how large a response is and how long it takes to recover really will depend on what skills they develop. So the clue to the children is, is well, we all have stress because we all get stressors and we feel awful. It causes us to feel awful. If you cope from it in a positive way, you handle that stress, you feel better for a long time. If you don't cope in it in a positive way, you'll only feel better for a short time, but that doesn't make you uh, really good at handling stress in the future. So the goal is, how do you learn to identify when that stress is getting too much? And how do you learn to kind of put it away a little bit and put it aside a little bit? And one 
great way is to practice stress reduction strategies and activities as a family. The first uh, two, I think we all know, healthy eating and exercise can help us reduce stress. Relaxation, we'll talk more about that later. Relaxation is wonderful to help you kind of get that stress away. Meditation, yoga, therapy, spiritual and religious activities, hobbies, uh, socializing with friends, journaling, creative outlets, laughter, comedy, sleep and rest. I know that's hard when you have an adolescent to get them to sleep and kids too, but uh, and we'll talk later about too, even for anxious children, getting good sleep can help them feel better able uh, to deal with their anxieties. Reading for enjoyment, singing or listen to music, hot baths, dancing, save, say no to save time for yourself. I know we adults have a hard time with that. This is a challenge one. Turn off the cell phone and emails. It just doesn't help you unwind. Have quality family time. Uh, prioritize uh, time management. Make sure that you don't uh, overburden yourself. Have time to play and say good things about yourself. So when you get all that stress building in your system, if you can reduce some of the stress that you have by doing some of these activities, you lower that level. And if you lower that level, wow, that can help you feel better and increase your confidence in yourself. So I mentioned before about the body, and a lot of studies that show that in general, adolescents especially don't get a lot of sleep. Uh, what happens is because they don't get a lot of sleep, they come into class, they're exhausted, and their body's pushing, and then they take caffeine or other things, sugars to kind of get them going a little bit, and then they crash in the afternoon because they're only short-lived. And what happens then is they get tired when they go home, and then they take naps or they have low energy and then they can't get to sleep because they've been napping all day long and it keeps the cycle going. So getting a good sleep cycle has been shown with adolescents to be a big, big factor in terms of helping them deal with stress in a much better way. And one way to deal with stress, though, if they, the child feeling a lot of it is to get some exercise. If they get exercise, it could be a wonderful way, a wonderful way for them to channel off some of that energy that's in their system. And it's also a wonderful activity for anxious children and kids who are feeling anxiety. Working the body, dissipating all that stress hormone are just wonderful things. And it gives more energy, gives a better sense of control, and it makes them smarter. It helps thinking, your cognitive processes work better, and obviously reduces stress. So this is a big thing, and I know it's, it's something we think we know, but these are kind of a, a good um, thing to talk about with your children uh, when you start to really talk about anxiety. And we'll talk a little bit about how to talk to your children about anxiety, but most of us kind of know about feelings, but we don't really know how to talk to our children about them. And, and these are kind of good things to kind of share with your children that there's a difference between thoughts and feelings, that I feel sad is different than I think I'm going to fail a test. Think I'm feel a test is not a feeling, it's a thought, and we can modify those thoughts. Feeling sad is an emotion. And as I'll mention throughout this presentation, feelings, including anxiety, are just feedback. It's a way for us to grow and learn. It's, it's nice to help children reframe it and see that that anxiety they're feeling is kind of a hint that something could be changed. And that's different than terror and anxiety, you know, panic. But we'll talk more about as we go through this presentation. Creating a common emotional vocabulary is really important because when I work with children or adolescents, one children's panic is another children's anxiety is another children's tension. So they're the same word, but children will ascribe or, or place different meanings on those words. So it's really important to kind of try to speak a common language. It's almost as if we need to really identify when a child says they're very upset. I look at what do you mean very upset? Well, I'm I'm terrified. Well, what do you mean by terrified? What does that mean? Could you tell me what being terrified really is all about? And they describe it, and I said, oh, it sounds like you're just worried. That's the word I would use. And we as adults have very different ways of talking than children do. So getting that vocabulary is really important. Uh, personal feelings versus feelings shared with others. Believe it or not, there's feelings that will tell other people, and there's feelings we hold inside. And, and I don't know if children understand that a little bit. Uh, for example, when your adolescent son or daughter does something independent, and they think you're going to be mad at them, but it was something positive for them, and you feel that bursting of pride. But if you say that to them, it could be helpful, but you might want to hold that in, because if you say it, they might think that it wasn't their accomplishment. They're only doing it to please you. So you hold that in. Well, that's 
personal feelings versus feelings you share with other people. And a lot of children don't aren't aware that not all feelings that they feel necessarily are understood by other people. And we'll talk one thing about children who are ang anxious, it's pretty common with them, is oftentimes what they feel they show by their behaviors, and they sometimes show it in their bodies. Uh, they don't really, I have an idea that we don't just understand how they feel, they have to kind of talk to us about it. And again, the body indicators of feelings that sometimes our stomach ache is that we're worried about a test, you know, and that's really important. Intensity of emotions will change, we'll talk about that in a minute, but there's a lot of intensity, like being a little anxious is just normal feedback the body's giving, but being frightened is a different level of emotion. So how do we bring the emotion down and, and how do we make sure that we feel okay having that level of emotion? Uh, and there's behaviors associated with feelings. Like when we get angry, a lot of times we get want to get aggressive. Okay, okay, so that's a behavior that's associated with aggressive, but it's much simpler to talk about your feelings than, and then banging your hand against a wall. That hurts, number one, and it creates consequences. But helping people know that when they're anxious, they can pace, they can call 10 friends, or they can do some relaxation. They can distract themselves. They can think about uh, what's bothering them. It's a lot easier than doing all that extra work. Feelings occur in combinations that oftentimes you're not just anxious, you're angry, sad, embarrassed, and happy at the same time. You can be all those different emotions and helping children sort those emotions out can be uh, really helpful for them. Teaching alternative behaviors of expressing feelings. Not every ch child likes to talk. Some children like to do creative writing, some beautiful writing I've seen from teenagers, drawing, kids are fantastic, art, um, and sometimes even music, children can express their feelings that way. Um, for example, I used to ask children when I used to see them uh, in therapy, I said, why don't you bring in your favorite songs and let's discuss what emotions they communicate. And one child brought in a song that made her anxious and had her anxiety, and she would, that was her anxious song. And learning that that was the way she understood her emotions. And again, normalizing emotions as, as being a way that our body just gives us feedback. And it's really, really important for children to know that anxiety is just that at a good level. If it's at a high level and it's making us uncomfortable, then we need to do something to, to deal with you know, that, to bring it down a little bit. But anxiety is something we all feel. Um, and again, um, I often share with the children, okay, you're telling me what your outside emotions, what you're telling everybody, but what's inside? You look kind of calm on the outside, but is there a bunch of squirrels running <laughs> inside of you? And the, is everything going, you know, getting you really frightened inside? Tell me what's going on. And they'll say, yeah, I'm really scared. Well, you're really good. You really keep it all down all, all out in front of you and nobody sees anything, but it seems like there's a lot going on. And giving a child permission that they trust you to have and to share those inside emotions can be really helpful for them. So it, it lets out some of the steam of what, what they have to carry to have all those feelings inside. Now, this is just an example. When you talk to anxious children, they'll use all these words interchangeably. I'm worried, frightened, concerned, tense, uneasy, apprehensive, a little curious, and but what's going to happen? I'm panicky. Well, I tell children, well, there's differences between low-level anxious words because I'm curious about what will happen. I'm a little tense at times. I get concerned. I'm a little uneasy, maybe unapprehensive about things, but that's just feedback. If I'm a little bit uneasy about something, for example, if I'm uneasy about the weather, I'll check the weather broadcast and find out what the weather's going to be. But if I'm worried and thoughts keep going through my mind that I, I, I and I'm frightened, that something's going to happen, I'm going to get hurt, or somebody love is going to happen, get, get hurt, I'm scared, I'm really frightened, I'm nervous, I'm panicky, I'm having all these panicky feelings, I'm really fearful. That's a higher level of anxiety. So children need to learn to use the low-level emotions as ways to learn about themselves, and what does that say to them? And the high-level emotions, they need to learn how to bring those emotions down a little bit by using some of the coping strategies we'll talk about a little bit. It's always fascinating, by the way, that I talk to children about, do you like scary movies? Now, I'm not a fan of scary movies, I tell them. But when I go to scary movies, it, you kind of shake in your seat and you don't know what's going to happen next because it's meant to scare you a little bit. And children will say, that's fun. That's great. I, I love those movies. And I said, well, you like being scared? Yeah, yeah, because I know it's not real. Oh, so you tell yourself something, even though you have the emotions, and it doesn't turn into real fear. It's kind of excitement fear. Okay. And you get them to start to realize that 
those emotions can be controlled. You know, you can go to a movie and get scared. You can pick a scary movie to watch and be scared, but you're electing to do it. So if you elect to have that emotion, you can elect or work not to have that emotions and letting them feel there's some control over that scary feeling that they have. Now, again, I mentioned before the difference between a thought and a feeling. Kids get confused. I think the coach does not like me is a thought. I think I like pizza better than vegetables is a thought. I think I do not think I studied enough for the test is a thought. I feel sad about not being picked for the team is an emotion. I feel happy when a pizza delivery arrives at the house is a feeling related to an event. And I am anxious about the upcoming test. In other words, it's a feeling about an upcoming event. So it's not a thought. So a lot of times when I talk to children, they get them both confused. And you can help the children too. I, I, I feel I'm going to do badly in the test. You say to them, no, I think you're going to do, you think you're going to do badly on the test. It's a thought. It's something you're saying to yourself. We call that self-talk. And how do we help you deal with that so you don't get as anxious? You should be a little anxious, and that will prompt you to study. But you shouldn't be terrified because that will work against you a little bit. Too much anxiety will kind of not help your performance. So we want to get you anxious because we want you to study, but we don't want you to be terrified. Now, I mentioned before about the different types of emotions. Well, the basic emotions that we share with uh, animals, most animals, are anxiety, anger, happiness, and sadness. And if you own a pet and I own a dog, I can tell you my dog gets anxious. My dog can be angry, especially when the postman <laughs> comes around. My dog gets happy when I walk in the house. Uh, and my dog can be sad when I'm leaving. You know, when I leave, he, he puts his head down on the floor and gives him me that little look. But every day I feel those feelings. I'm anxious because I had a meeting before this presentation. I didn't know if I'd get on. I was angry because the presentation went longer. Maybe frustrated would be a better word. I'm happy that I'm presenting because I, I love to present to parents. Uh, and I'm a little sad that uh, tonight I'm not going to see my, my son because he's traveling. So I have all those emotions. And that's just a typical day. Those are basic natural emotions we all share. So if your child feels anxiety, anger, happiness, sadness, in small degrees, that's just a typical day. In fact, you can ask your child, did you feel any, what did you feel anxious about? What did you feel angry or frustrated about? What made you happy? What did you feel happy about today? And did you feel kind of disappointed or, or sad about anything today? And again, teaching the language of talking about that. A lot of feelings, though, are what's called manufactured or secondary feelings. We learn those feelings because those are feelings that are words. We, we learn to put in words to combinations of feelings like, what is shame? Well, shame is kind of anxiety and a fear of being rejected with some sadness that you're in this situation, but anger that you have to be worried about being embarrassed. So shame is all those emotions. So it's one of those ones that's manufactured. And it's a product of our culture, and it's a product of whatever culture the child's raised in. And a lot of emotions are combos. They're combo packages. You get a lot of emotions, and that's that's part of what we need to understand about feelings. This is a, a funny diagram I teach children that with all these feelings like guilty, ecstatic, frustrated, mischievous, cautious, ashamed, hopeful, overwhelmed, all these feelings are manufactured, and they're caused by thoughts. The primary emotions, the happy, anger, sad, um, anxious feelings. Those are all emotions that are just natural to us as, as, as humans or as mammals. These emotions have some thoughts associated with it. And we can help children a little bit kind of feel more in control by kind of helping them figure out what are they saying to help generate these other emotions or to make their anxiety worse than it has to be. So I talked about relaxation strategies. If you can relax with your children or show them how you relax, that is an awesome thing if you can do it. And it's hard because every family has different time. I know everybody's pressed being working and doing things and schedules are hard to coordinate. But if you can find a common family activity that you can use um, to help you guys um, practice relaxation together as a family and then apply it when you're feeling anxious, that's really awesome. Now, I get asked questions by parents a lot. Well, I watch TV with my kids. That's relaxing. It could be, but a lot of times it's just distraction. It's not really relaxation because you're watching a football game, exciting, especially if your, your team is winning. 
But if you, it's not really relaxing per se, it's a distraction. It's something that's amusing, it's entertaining. Relaxation is when you just let go of all thinking, you let go of all your current problems, everything just flows out of you and you feel that kind of warm feeling of just floating along that way. And depending on who you are, different things will work. Some people like to do muscle relaxation exercises or some people go for massages um, and mu rubbing your aching muscles feels good. Some people use imagery. You know, uh, what's that favorite place, that favorite vacation you guys went to? Was it rafting? Was it was it uh, taking a, a, uh, a driving tour through the country? Was it climbing a mountain together? And you sit together and you talk about that and you all kind of feel that kind of nice, nice feeling. Breathing together, breathing exercises. I'll give you a little bit of a, a breathing exercise example in a moment, but doing breathing together, not hyperventilating, breathing in through the mouth, in through the nose, I'm sorry, and out through the mouth in a calm, controlled way is another thing. Mindfulness training, wonderful way to kind of help you stay focused and eliminate all those thoughts that are bothering you. Music, art, creativity, another other great ways to relax. And warmth, going to a beach, taking a warm bath or a warm shower, all great strategies. So how do you help incorporate relaxation, especially with an anxious child? And tip, it's not going to work every time they're anxious. It's a skill that takes a while to develop. It can take weeks to develop if they practice every day. So oftentimes a child will be in session with me and they'll learn a relaxation strategy and they'll come in all angry and say, it didn't work. They said, well, it's not going to work right away. You got to practice it a lot. If you practice it a lot and you get really good at it, you can just take a breath and you feel relaxed right away. And it's going to take a little while. We can practice every week. But don't expect if you start to relax that tomorrow, everybody's anxiety is going to drop. It takes a little time. Now, breathing is a cool one to do as a family, and it's simple. And obviously, if you have any asthma or respiratory issues, this might not work, and you'll have to check with your doctor if there's, you have some concerns. But for a lot of people, breathing training is the simplest thing we can do. And uh, exhale, every time we exhale and not inhale, that's when we relax. So what you do is you start, close your eyes, and you start focus down, focusing on your breathing, and you slow down your breathing. And what happens is you concentrate and every time you exhale, you say the word calm or relax to yourself. And you pause and count to four by taking a second breath. So you breathe in, in a slow way, you breathe out, and you say calm, relax to yourself. You pause for about four seconds or less, depending on your lung capacity. You take a second breath and you just focus on your breathing. You let everything else, all those distractions, shopping list, uh, emails, texts that you have to return, shows you want to watch, people that you're angry at, you just let the, all that go and just focusing on your breathing. It's a great tool. And you say to yourself, the relaxation occurs with the exhalation. And every time you exhale, breathing out, you say calm or relax to yourself. It's a great tool. And if you do it, I think you'll appreciate what I'm saying. Now, a major talk about our talk, and it's important, is to kind of learn to talk to our kids about anxiety. And, and anxiety gets a, a bad rap sometimes because anxiety is a normal emotion we all face, and it's based on anticipation. About 90% of all anxiety is anticipation. It's what we anticipate, we predict is going to happen, but it's normal. We all face it. And again, our goal is to reduce the amount of anxiety, not to get rid of all of anxiety. You can't. And it's a healthy emotion. It's a normal primary emotion. It's not to get rid of it. It's to get how much we have. Now, a child oftentimes don't really don't recognize that their fear or worry is unreasonable. And they'll argue that it's just and real and you should be afraid and we should be terrified and that teachers mean or whatever they're they're worried about. Well, they don't necessarily see it as unreasonable because they don't have life experience. And helping them understand how they can feed or build their anxiety is really, really important to help them understand how to reduce that level of anxiety. And as we talked about before, children may express their anxiety through health complaints or actions. Certainly, you can ask the school nurse, uh, you know, when there's anxiety about a test or anxiety about something that's going on in the school a lot of children line up to go to the nurse's office with headaches, stomach aches, back aches. And you may find that in the morning with your children going to school, you face the same issues sometimes. And sometimes anxious people do things 
because they're anxious. Sometimes the children will be more hyperactive or, you know, check things. And we'll talk a little bit more about conditions that can develop because of prolonged anxiety. Children don't sometimes understand what's making them anxious, what the stressor is, what's causing the anxiety. So helping children understand what the anxiety triggers or situation where the child feels most anxiety in is really important. You just say, listen, it seems to be that every Friday, um, you know, um, you start to worry about exams because you have an exam on Monday. So do you think it's the test, not exactly Friday that you're worried about? And you get, you know, and then you can help them work on their test anxiety and what they may be worried about, about their anxiety. So helping them see what the source of the anxiety and that it's all not everything. They're not always anxious. Some children do suffer from general anxiety, but not all. Um, and most children usually have something specifically they're anxious about. And this is the one that I've learned uh, as both a psychologist and as a parent that crying irritability and angry outburst often are misunderstood as being oppositional or disobedient, which may be the child's attempt to avoid the anxiety provoking situation at any cost. You say to the child, okay, let's, uh, we're going to go to the sports practice and the child starts getting difficult, won't put on their sweatpants or is you know, crying and whiny and difficult. Well, they might not want to go to sports practice because the coach might have yelled at them the last practice or another child on the team has been mean to them or something. So don't necessarily take it personally. I tell parents, uh, children's behavior sometimes means more than them just being disobedient. Sometimes there could be something below the surface. Remember that inner, inner voice or that interface of emotions that uh, you know can cause problems for them that they have to share with you. So you have to just be aware that there might be more going on. Uh, it's important to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of avoidance. Sometimes it's good to face your fears, and sometimes it's good to wait <laughs> to face your fears. And part of a good parenting plan is to help the child figure out whether they should avoid it temporarily and face it in a couple of days, maybe break it up into small steps before they face the thing they're most afraid of. Again, it can be a nice strategy because sometimes the best thing to do is not to face things. I think sometimes children feel that you're going to be mad at them because they didn't face their fear of, of dogs or of uh, situations that they're afraid of, of, uh, you know, of lightning or whatever. But sometimes you avoid things. That's okay. But ultimately, avoidance causes problems because you never get the skills to learn how to face it. So eventually, we want to face things, but gradually in a step-by-step -step practice, a uh, step-by-step way, because we want to make sure that we have the skills necessary to take that challenge on. The big danger of anxiety, uh, and it, it is something, it's called the fear network. And what happens with the fear network is anxiety builds and it starts to spread to other things. So a child who's afraid of one thing will become afraid of another thing, becomes another afraid of another thing. So suppose you have a shy child and the child doesn't like speaking in class, so they don't speak in class. Well, then they might not want to stand out in class. So they don't want to excel in class. So they don't do as well. And because they're afraid of not doing too well, they sit in the back of the room. So they start to isolate from the other kids. Do you follow it? It starts to get bigger and bigger. And oftentimes you have to kind of help the child understand that if they always avoid certain things, what happens is that fear network will grow in their brain and everything will make them frightened. So they have to take small steps at learning how to face and have and be comfortable with anxiety at a low level. Uh, again, never try to tell the child that they shouldn't feel anxious because we all feel anxiety. We feel anxiety every day, no matter what we might call it. The goal is to help the child not have anxiety where it's so big that they can't uh, face it or handle it or feel a lot of stress because of it. Now, this is a fascinating study, and I'm just pointing it out because it works. Uh, one study found that having ninth grade students write about their test anxiety for 10 minutes immediately before taking final exams significantly improved test scores compared to control groups who didn't write about it. Simple thing, just making a child aware of their anxiety and the thoughts that are associated with the anxiety helps control the anxiety. And there was a, a study that found that. I thought that's amazing. So oftentimes not talking about anxiety doesn't help. Talking about anxiety, learning what's causing it and helping a child develop coping skills can help them really take on that challenge. So I mentioned before about self-talk or thoughts that a child is, is doing. Remember, thoughts are different than feelings. Feelings are our reactions. Thoughts are, are what we say to ourselves, what's in our head. And oftentimes, 
with children, it's hard for them to kind of figure out what, what are they really anxious about or what are they anxious? What is that anxious thought? And uh, I like to call them uh, thought traps, you know, uh, thought traps are thoughts that we get stuck in. And when we do there, the anxiety just keeps building and building and building. So help the child figure out what's the thought, what's that thought trap? And we'll go through some common thought traps. And what you want to do when you catch a thought trap, you want to gather evidence for and against the thought, like a scientist or detective. Okay, so you think that all the kids in school are going to think that your new shirt is ugly. And all kids, that sounds like a thought trap to me. But let's gather evidence. Let's figure out you wear that shirt. Can how many children laughed at you, pointed at you? Because there's how many kids in your class? 30 kids in your class. Let's see what happens. And if it's most of the kids, 100% of the kids in the class, well, okay, then you don't have to wear that shirt anymore. Teaching them to be a scientist rather than just accepting that that thought trap is true. One way to kind of help a child kind of figure that out is what's another way of looking at the situation? And how would your friend or another person see the same situation? You want to let them see that it's their thinking or self-talk that's adding to the anxiety, not necessarily the situation. The other thing we'll talk about is about probability is how likely is it to happen? What else might happen instead? Have you ever managed a situation like this in the past? So what makes this so different? Now, you want to show them that they have competency. They've been able to handle things in the past and jeepers. They can take it on. They don't have to be frightened of it. And Finally, another strategy is, what is the worst that could happen? Um, okay, so people laugh at you. Tell me, I know that's hard when you're young, but what's so bad about that? If they laugh at you, okay, maybe they have no taste in clothes and you have better taste than they do. Again, helping them see that the what they think is awful is not the most awful, that you still love them and they still have their family behind them and their good friends will stick up with them too. So thoughts lead to feelings, lead to actions leads to results, which if they cause avoidance, will keep those thoughts going. We want to break that cycle. We want to change thoughts, to change feelings, to change actions, leads to positive results. So those thoughts, especially the thought traps, don't get fed. So one fun way to do that is to teach about self-talk is thought bubbles. You know, help a child kind of get a sense of that self-talk. What do they say to themselves? So what I do is I show something like this. It's a mother talking to a boy, and the mother's saying something, but there's a thought bubble above the child's head, and there's a thought bubble above dad's head. What, is, what do you think the dad's thinking? What do you think the boy's thinking? What do you think the mom's thinking? You know, and, and what happens is you get the child to realize that mom might be saying, you can't go out today, and the boy might be saying, I can't go out with dad. That's terrible, awful. I'm mad at mom. Okay, and dad might be saying, where's my golf clubs? <laughs> you know, you again, you get the children to, to know that oftentimes what we say outside is one thing, but oftentimes we say things to ourselves called self-talk, which reflect our thoughts and sometimes these thought traps. And again, there's other ways to show it. Uh, this is another example of a thought trap. Um, obviously, uh, uh, SpongeBob is another example. You can put thought traps, uh, thought stop. Ugh. You can thought bubbles there too to help a child kind of understand that what they say to themselves does make them more anxious and how to catch that so they don't get more anxious. It's really, really can be very helpful. Um, so I want to talk about the thought traps here. And uh, these are kind of just examples of thought traps that we get caught into. We have the pessimist or the catastrophizer, always thinking the worst is going to happen. We have the repetitor. It happened once and it's always going to happen that way. The kids laughed at me. They're going to laugh at me again, again, and again. The avoider, staying away from a situation you think are scary without trying first. The mind reader, reading minds, jumping to a conclusion that someone is thinking bad about you. The fortune teller, predicting what will happen in the future, usually predicting that things will go badly when they oftentimes will go positively. The shoulds, Having the shoulds, oughts, and musts is like having a cold. You can have a bad case of the shoulds. The perfectionist, setting expectations that are too high, believing that you're not good enough and will be punished if you make a mistake. Walking with blinders, not thinking of all the possible good things that will happen, just thinking something unwanted or negative is going to happen. And then there's pick, 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 
missing the good parts, but picking out the potential dangers in any situations. And these types of thought traps can get kids stuck and will lead them to have more and more anxiety. So as a parent, you have to, again, normalize the experience of fear and anxiety. We all have it. And help the children plan to face the fears in small steps. Identify with them what may get in the way. They may need to avoid things for a little while, and that's okay. But help them problem solve. Help them figure out what they need to do to kind of figure out ways to kind of deal with that problem. Encourage independence. Um, explain that a lot of things they're afraid of and anxious about are time limited. They go away and give them lots and lots of praise. So problem solving is something that's really helpful because for an anxious child, they, they're making that prediction that something bad's going to happen. And there's only one way out of this. And that's not a good thinking for children. You can help them explore alternative solutions, brainstorming. Well, what else could happen? What else could you do? And sort out them. What are the advantages and disadvantages, cost benefits, pros and cons for that decision? Help the children see that it's not automatic. There's no automatic process that if they think that, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's a prediction, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. And as I mentioned before, have them take a different perspective. What would someone else say? And Make sure they know the problem and decision and only work on one problem at a time because what happens is, is everything gets dumped. I, I, I don't want to go to school tomorrow because it's a test and the teachers are going to yell at me and the other kids will make fun of me. And then gym class, they so-and-so said something to me the other day and I don't know if he wants to fight with me. Ooh, that's a lot to be anxious about and a lot to be worried about. Let's pick one. Let's try to work on one and let's walk through it a little bit about Let's make sure we check for thought traps and let's figure out what are the other ways of handling that situation. And oftentimes children don't see that there's a short, middle and long-term process that life is about. There's a past, present and a future and give the child that perspective that I know this is worrisome today and I'm not trying to minimize how much this makes you feel anxious, but there is a tomorrow. Just be appreciate that there is a tomorrow to a lot of things you're frightened of. Thought stopping is another great strategy that can be used. And a thought stopping is a cool technique because basically you take a negative thought that the child has, you cause some distraction for the child, and you have them replace it with a positive thought. And it can help them stopping from having that thought that's making them anxious all the time. So again, you have them stop the negative thought and tell them, well, I hear you're really worried and you think a lot about the test. Tell me something positive. Tell me, tell me something that is a, an image that can you know get that stopped a little bit because you want to stop the train on the tracks. You want to stop that thought from keep going and thought stopping to, can help children just stop that from happening a little bit. Oftentimes, a lot of anxiety as we talked about is kids don't know how to be effective interpersonally or assert themselves. And I know this is very quick, but understand that there's cost to being passive and aggressive uh, and help them improve their social skills and confidence by role plays. Help them manage provocations, not just punch the guy in the nose, learn how to not take the bait in that provocation, not, not get pulled into what that other person is saying to get them in trouble. Set boundaries on request of others. Saying no is not a bad thing to say sometimes and help them evaluate their relationships. You know, are they healthy? Are they happy? What are you getting from their relationships? And that these are the cornerstones of really helping the child learn to assert themselves about what they might be anxious about. Praise can't do it enough. Most of us want to do it more, but be specific about what you praise. Just don't say you're a wonderful child. Be specific. Try to notice the positive. Don't always focus on the negative. Be consistent. Do it as soon as possible. And don't use the buts. Uh, you really did a good job, but buts always negates it. Don't get the buts out of your, <laughs> buts out of your life. Be enthusiastic and give it often. Uh, again, it's a good way to help an anxious child begin to feel they can handle things. And the other way to help children uh, learn, and I think it's really powerful, is help them identify other coping role models. Who has faced an adversity? Who's handled it? And it can be a great way for children to really learn how to, to face things that they fear and take on things that are really challenging them. Help them find those people. It could be someone from history. It could be an athlete. It could be anybody. But help them learn that person's story in that life and how they've dealt with some of the anxieties that they had to go through. Now, a lot of anxiety is about predictions, and I'm not picking on people who do fortune cookies or people who gamble or people who predict the weather, but I learned that what it says on my phone or on TV about the weather oftentimes doesn't happen. 
And uh, people I know are betting online or going to uh, racetracks or whatever to bet. Well, if it was so easy, they'd be making a lot of the money, but they keep going back. So betting is not necessary. Even if they think they know everything, it doesn't really work. And I, I've ate lots of fortune cookies because I enjoy Chinese food. And maybe one in 30 has some truth to it. So oftentimes what we predict doesn't actually happen. And there's a difference between probability with, you know, that was really happening and the possibility that it could happen. And it's a fascinating thing that I, I really find very interesting. And I studied it a lot. And one thing I asked when I work with students is how many shark attacks occur in the United States each year? Wow, hundreds. Well, according to what I looked up, it's only about 16 sharks attacks each year, 16, that's all. And there's what, well over 300 million people in the United States. That's not a lot of shark attacks. A lot of people swimming, a lot of people in the water. That's not a lot of shark attacks. 16. So why do we why do we overestimate things so much? Well, people assign a greater probability to vivid and easily imagined deaths, uh, events like like being attacked by a shark because it's horrible and gross, we think it's common, but it's really not. It's just that fear overestimates statistical odds. People use feelings to estimate risks. Uh, highly dreaded, unusual fear arousing events are viewed as more possible, uh, probable. So because it's scary, we think it's more probable when it's probably not. People are more influenced by more negative than positive information. And people tend to remember negative information better than prior material. So if a child is told that the teacher is mean, they're going to think that the teacher is mean and be frightened of the teacher, even though they haven't experienced the teacher because negative information tends to hold prey a little bit more than positive information. People will more likely complain about a restaurant than compliment a restaurant. People will leave negative reviews more often than positive reviews. Again, kids get caught in that negativity bias and it makes them more frightened. Social implication, the risk perception about things could be happening increases if there is ambiguity, doubt, or misinformation, which promotes fear and instigates rumors. That's why it's really important to try to tell your child what's going on and not hold the truth back and talk to them at their level because otherwise kids will make it worse than it really is. Now, I'd like to talk a second about the impact of the pandemic on child mental health. This is a study that was released in 2022, this year, and looked at 35 studies with over 65,000 participants aging from four to 19 years of age. And they found that one of the biggest casualties of the pandemic was an increased anxiety in children. Almost 28% you know, of children reported anxiety as a result of the pandemic. And what was fascinating the most is that social and family support, and that's why I commend you guys for listening to this presentation, positive coping style was associated with better outcomes. And that children and adolescents with mental health, developmental disorders were especially vulnerable. But you can't also forget, I know this presentation is about anxiety, but depression, loneliness, stress, fear, tension, anger, fatigue, confusion, and worry, if you bundle them all together, there's a lot of anxiety and fear in children, and learning how to face fear is really, really important for these children. Now, anxiety disorders do occur in children, and about 9% of all children aged 3 to 17 have clinically diagnosable anxiety disorders, and sometimes um, they're missed. And for children with anxiety, more than one in three also had behavior problems, and about one in three also had depression. And if left untreated, anxiety disorders increase the risk of depression, addictions, and suicidality. So what are the anxiety disorders? Well, these are the statistics. And you can see at 12 to 17, anxiety grows tremendously. And depression grows also, but anxiety just jumps uh, in that 12 to 17-year-old age group. Separation anxiety disorder is more for younger children. And then that's when kids explain uh, inappropriate fear about separation from home or significant attachment figures. They worry excessively about their own parents' safety. Phobias is a fear of a particular object or situation that is avoided or endured with great distress, extreme distress or impairment related to the fear. And I said extreme. It's common for children who don't have phobias to have one or more specific phobia, but it doesn't cause extreme distress or impairment. For example, if you see a spider crawling around, some kids will shriek, but they won't run out of the room. They'll just shriek. And that's not great distress, that's my minor distress, and that's common. 
But some children really become terrified, and that's really when phobia needs to have clinical treatment. Post-traumatic stress disorder develops after a life-threatening event to the child or a close family member or as a result of sexual violence. And post-traumatic stress disorder is treatable. There's some great treatments for it, but if not uh, treated, it can result in persistent avoidance, negative thoughts and emotions, increases in anxiety, and uh, intrusive thoughts, nightmares, and flashbacks. Obsessive compulsive disorder is another anxiety problem where kids have these recurrent thoughts and images in their mind, which are not wanted, which lead to anxiety and doubt. And they engage in compulsive behaviors or rituals like hand washing, checking, uh, counting, repeating, or balancing, which must be performed in response to the obsession to reduce anxiety. Generalized anxiety disorder where children have chronic excessive worry in a number of areas, such as schoolwork, social interactions, family health, safety, world events, and natural disasters. And they're often perfectionistic. Uh, they show high reassurance seeking and may struggle with more fears, which they keep hidden. These are children who are just afraid about a variety of things and worry is most of the time. A social phobia is a child who feels scared or uncomfortable in one or more social settings or performance situations. And it's fairly common, uh, more so than we realize, that how many children have a fear of being watched or judged by others, a fear of doing something embarrassing in social situations. And how it translates to the child's academic progress is it causes a child to have difficulty answering questions in class, reading aloud, initiating conversations, talking with unfamiliar people, and attending parties and social events. So the children kind of fall out of being with other friends. So oftentimes the anxiety, the social phobia is really the condition that's there, and it can be really crippling for children. Uh, and oftentimes the reason I bring up these disorders is we hope that children don't have these disorders, but when children do, they can be crippling for children and they can cause children to really have great difficulty moving on in their lives. Panic disorder does happen, and it's oftentimes reflecting uh, hormonal changes that a child could be going through. But some children have these intense fear that occurs unexpectedly and without reason. It's not due to anything else. It's just they, their body reacts. And it must be really difficult for these children to have these just fears come out of the blue. It just must be really hard for them. And what happens is the child begins to avoid places where the attacks have occurred. And uh, these panic attacks uh, become disabling, so they start to have agoraphobia, fear of going out of the house, uh, and they start to have these strong, strong feelings and have other complications. So panic disorder, again, is treatable, but a lot of children will have this and just try to find ways that they'll try to remedy it. Sadly, a lot of children turn to substance use uh, or behavior that helps them prove that they're brave when they're really quite frightened, and it's important to recognize that there are positive ways and negative ways you cope with fear, including panic. And the positive ways help reduce it. The negative ways help the children numb, help the children feel confident about it, but really don't help them because they're not getting rid of the problem. All they're doing is, is putting a, a big uh, mask or rug over the issues that really bother them. And they really have to face them a little bit. Now, they've done studies about uh, for anxiety disorders. Uh, these are clinical disorders. What can cause that in children? And they found that anxious parents model fear and anxiety. If you're an anxious parent, you're modeling that the child should be afraid of everything. So you might need to do some work for yourself on that. And they reinforce anxious coping behavior and may unwillingly maintain avoidance despite the desire to be of help to their child. So you got to put the mirror up. So if you have any anxiety that you pass on to your children, well, they're going to start to be anxious themselves. And even though you love them and you want the best for them, you're going to give them that fear of the world and give them all those thought traps that they'll be caught in. For example, uh, if a child's going to school and you say to the child, uh, don't talk to anybody you don't know in school, um, uh, don't leave the teacher's sight at all times. Well, it's kind of hard if you're in a new school not to talk to people you don't know. Obviously, you don't want the child talking to people who are not appropriately in school or shouldn't be in school, but other children... And what the child will then do is start to be afraid of strangers and you know, other children, for example. Um, so how do you help the child learn how to have good judgment about who is may not be safe, like a stranger or adult they don't know, but who a child they don't know but might is not dangerous, who they should approach? Again, parents need to kind of take a look in the mirror and kind of see if they can help their children. 
overprotective, overcontrolling, and overcritical parenting styles limit the development of independence and confidence in their children and maintain anxiety too. So you have the overprotective and then you have the anxious parent um, kind of can get child children more frightened and not help them with their anxiety. And relationships with children, uh, caregivers who the child believes are not willing to able to protect them. Children need to believe you got their back. No matter what they, they that happens, you, you're going to be able to protect them. You're going to be behind them. You're going to do things to help them. And, and that's really important. If you can be one of those people who can help a child always believe that you're there, whether you're their parent, caregiver, aunt, uncle, neighbor, uh, teacher, educator, that you're always there to support them if they're anxious, that does a long, long way for a child taking risks to help learn how to be resilient and face in their fears. Again, that's really important. Now, what I wanted to talk a little bit about before we finish up is there are some medical issues that look like anxiety. Um, and certainly you can talk with your pediatrician about these things. But one one I want to point out is caffeineism. I'm amazed, amazed at how much caffeinated drinks children uh, ingest, uh, including chocolate, carbonated beverages. And that can give this kind of anxiety symptoms to children. It gives them the shakes sometimes. And I I, you got to be careful of how much caffeine they take in. Other medical conditions that can have anxiety symptoms include hyperthyroidism, migraines, asthma, seizure disorders, leg in, lead intoxication, and drug withdrawal. Again, if the child's having these anxiety uh, attacks after going out with friends one night, maybe there were some substances and maybe there's something else going on that you need to be careful of a little bit. Uh, and look into that a little bit, because sometimes withdrawal from a drug can, can lead to that. Um, prescription drugs can also have uh, side effects, especially anti-asthmatics, uh, sympio, sympathometrics, steroids, SSRIs, diet pills, antihistamine, cold medicines, major tranquilizers, all medications. So again, it's good to work with your pediatricians. And as, as I said before, anytime you suspect a child's anxiety might be too much or fit any of those disorders that I've talked about, it's good to consult a mental health professional uh, for an assessment to make sure that child is, is getting their issues addressed. And there are also other mental health conditions, I won't spend much time in this, that have similar sy symptoms as anxiety disorders, children with ADHD sometimes, autism spectrum disorders, children with learning disabilities, for example, develop persistent worries about school performance, bipolar disorder, uh, children, depressed children, and children who suffer from psychosis all can have kind of that anxious symptoms. That's why it's really important to consult with a mental health professional. So again, you can do a lot to help your child feel less anxious. And if you incorporate any of these activities, it will go a long way to helping your child feel more confident to face those fears in a gradual way, knowing that you're behind them and you can help them. Now, I have one favor to ask you guys to do if you're watching this, either uh, live or taped. If you could please uh, take your phone and uh, access this survey. It's just four questions, but it helps us uh, give feedback to our funders uh, to let them know how the presentations are going, and hopefully you're happy with all that you heard. Again, it's an honor talking to you. Thanks so much for watching this, uh, either live or through a tape, and uh, yeah, appreciate it. And thank you for helping a child feel uh, they can control and handle those high levels of anxiety and accept that anxiety is not so bad. It's one of our feelings. And if you can work with that anxiety and help manage it, it can give you good feedback. Thank you, Dr. Demaria. I uh, appreciate your presentation. Uh, great information. And I know the parents watching and who are going to watch it later will uh, get a lot. There's a lot to unpack. Um, for those who are watching next month on January 23rd, we will have the next presentation. It will be also by Dr. Demaria. And the topic will be helping your child manage their anger. So we look forward to that one next month. And uh, with that, we are finished. Thank you, everyone.